Hello, today we'll talk about the game Titan Strike from SBI from 1979. It's what call, what's called a capsule game, which is basically um, so the the map, the rules, the counters all come contained with it within a you know this kind of sleeve that is basically a folded you know eight and a half by eleven size. Here's a sense of the scale for you. So, first of all, you, this is the, you know, this is the cover art, and generally in these capsule games from SBI, the the cover then folds out to be the map. I mean, I think the um, the art is nice. It's a little bit, you know, cartoonish, but I think it's it's well done. <laughs> And so this, all these, um, you know, documents and counters come within this, you know, plastic sleeve. So, so that's the cover. And then the back, also, you know, it's consistent, the art. And um, so it gives you, I mean, I do like the art. It seems kind of, you know, unique. And so it gives you a bit of the theme. <clears throat> so the Martian Rebellion of 2093 had frayed the economic fabric of the entire solar system. As the USA and USSR gambled on the development of interstellar colonization, the European economic community and the hegemony of Eastern Asia surveyed the outer system. Most important among the new colonies was Titan, the largest moon of Saturn. Beneath whose barren surface lay the salvation of civilization, fissionable materials sufficient to feed Earth's hung hungry reactors. Cooperation marked the early efforts of the two colonizing powers, but by 2017, 2117, 12 years after the first fissionable site, economic and territorial disputes precipitated war. Titan Strike simulates the struggle between the EEC and the HEA in deep space and on Titan itself. So that gives you theme. It's basically a struggle between the the EEC and the HEA for mining on Titan. So that's the cover. And like I said, um, yeah, that contains a map which I'll show in a bit. The other components are the rules. So, similar to many of their other capsule games, it's four pages of rules, which you know for a, a game is you know pretty efficient. You know, it's got some you know useful you know diagrams. And then also there's the charts and tables, and you know two sets of them, which is because it's it is a two-player game, and um, it can easily, as they say in the rules, be played solo. So, so they have that for for two players. And then so you have it comes with a a card with. Um, you know, to punch out of a hundred counters. So then as far as the counters go, they're you know it's kind of a standard kind of war game kind of information on the counters. And a lot of SPI games are, you know, war games, so that you know kind of makes sense. So typically you know the counters you'll have this is a arranged combat strength this is you know the type of unit this is the range this is the the close combat strength and this is the movement allowance and this is a obviously a pictorial of the component so that's the general information so the different so the different units, you know, they're 
the difference between the um, the EC, EEC and the HEA. A lot of the components are similar between the two. There's a little bit difference in you know columns of and some of the strengths of, but I mean they're very similar, but you know not identical. So. So this is a heavy inter infantry unit. This is uh, engineering uh, infantry. And same here, of course. So this is, this is a hopper. Several, you know, several hoppers. They basically can, you know, jump, hence the name. Um, is a TECV, is kind of a, a drone kind of tank, is my understanding. Um, well, so this is a, this is a, this is a tank, this, this is a, these are drones, so, um, a little bit different. You know, these being drones, these being TCVs, so not necessarily drones. Um, and then, so these are Hoover Crafts. These are lasers. These are different uh, air air based units. So. And then the other players, so these are, you know, like I said, there's some similarities. Hoovercraft, uh, hoppers, heavy infantry, engineers, heavy infantry, uh, TCVs through here. Um, some different, you know, air-based units, how it serves. And again, you see there, there's a little bit of difference between the two. Uh, lasers. And, you know, some more flight aircraft. So that's the... That's the counters. Then let's go out to the map here. So it's, it's you know, it's okay cardstock. No, no complaints. <clears throat> this is the map. I mean, personally, I like it. It's the, uh, yeah, like I said, it's a little bit cartoonish, but I mean, I like, yeah, you know, it's, you know, professionally done. And it, it, uh, you know, kind of the, the look of it is similar, you know, to the cover art of the, um, you know, kind of the, the book that surrounds the sleeve that surrounds it, and it defines the different. It's interesting how it's depicting Titan. You know, it's you know changed a little bit from our you know recent understanding of Titan, but it's it's kind of interesting. So you know, it having you know a lot of hydrocarbons on it. So um, so there's a ammonia sea, and. You know, there's a mesa and different, you know, kind of puddles of Mona. And this is a dry sea. So, and it's hex based. And so the distance across each hex is you know, basically a kilometer. So that's the components. So then I'll step through the rules. And it's, uh, you know, it's got some interesting, you know, concepts. So, First of all, you know, kind of showing the outline here. Um, introduction, you know, we talked before about the theme of the two competing parties for basically the the mining uh, playing pieces we talked about. Uh, set up, so there's, it turns out there's three different scenarios with this, and they diff have different setups as far as 
um, where the units are placed or it also has scenarios where uh, units will be entering onto the map from outside. Talks about what range means and what initiative means. So sequence then you do what's called electronic warfare, which is basically attempting to to jam communications of your opponents. And if you are successful in doing that, then that'll have you know detrimental effects, obviously, on your your opponent. So there's the electronic warfare, sky camp combat phase. Like I said, there's some sky units. Skydive, so some sky units can land, basically. Um, anti escape phase, you know, firing from land based units to sky units. Ranged fire, you know, based on their, some, you know, different, you know, ranges they have. Uh, land movement, so you move your, your elements your land-based elements and, and then you do close combat so this would be you know items in the same hex talks about electronic warfare so basically you each player chooses um, they each have six frequencies which they can attack from and the other one has six frequencies that they, they attack from so you are given you get a certain number of electronic warfare points and then you distribute that among which frequency you're trying to jam of your opponent. So it's a kind of interesting concept. And then based on your, and that's based on, you know, the, the points you've uh, set aside for each, you know, frequencies. So there's some, you know, guess going on there. And then uh, if you're successful, then you determine the amount of superiority. And then if they're jammed, you know, it affects um, you know, some movement in, in combat, which we'll show in a little bit. Uh, it talks about doing sky combat, and there's several... So there's, you know, a lot of these are referring to these charts where... Um, and it's basically, you know, chances of kind of locking on based on, you know, differential, uh, you know, the combat differentials you have, etc. And we'll show that when we get to the play. Um, so you see if you lock on, you see if you hit, and then you do consequences of that. So skydiving, so taking, you know, units and then you know, going, you know, on the map. And then also combat of land against sky, and then there's a kind of a combat chart. Range combat, so this is firing or obviously over distances. Um, how you define, you know, your line of fire how land movement works. There's caverns, so how, how you move in caverns, how the effect of climbing slopes. Hoppers are interesting because they can, I mean, they jump and then they have a chance of crashing based on what, what terrain there is. So there, there are terrain effects. And like I showed, there's several different, you know, types of terrain and the different terrain has different effects so you know basically you know there's movement costs and there's combat modifiers depending on you know um, you know where the uh, where the target is so, and where you know where you're moving from so you can see the different the different types of terrain again and there's and then there's close combat and then another option as well as in the base rules is ammon the flooding so these are basically dams of the great ammonia sea and you can attack these dams 
and then if you're successful it'll start basically flooding this dry bed and each turn it'll flood like six a distance of six hexes so that's a any, any land unit that contacts that is destroyed so it's a interesting you know idea so and then you can um, you can kind of hide TCVs and drones basically having them having the counters you know flipped over in the board so they don't know what they are so that's the base rules and then optional you can some you know positives and negatives of doing ambush um, capturing drones and then like I said it gives you three you know good scenarios and um, you know as a skirmish between forces and it does say here that you know, it's two player but it can easily be played solo by basically the electronic warfare you just randomize you the the frequencies you're trying to jam and that's how you randomize and then and then it's easy to play you know one player and I'll show that a bit here so one is skirmishes uh, another is you know specifically about you know the scenario of there's a uh, you know there you know there's an issue of you know equipment supplies at kind of one of the the main plant um, locations of the mines and then so there's different you know forces deployed and then another another scenario of a different you know engagement so so three good scenarios and then there's some variety of you know how you can set up components so there is some you know replayability there so setting up for play here so the game gives you, you know, three scenarios of different levels of complexity. One is a skirmish, which is only land-based units. It's kind of an introductory one. There's no flight units, and there's no electronic warfare. So it's a good, you know, start up. But I won't be doing that because I want to show more of the aspects of the game. There's Strike and Titan Prime, which has all the the aspects of the game. Is has a lot of units, you know, including flight units and does the electronic warfare. So I'll be doing that one. Me engagement is also a big, big scenario with a lot of, you know, all the options as far as components. But there's more randomization as far as when the units enter. You roll dice to determine, you know, what turn that components come in. So, so I'll be doing the strike and Titan Prime. So, so it's a discussed is Titan Prime was the HEA's most important base. Its headquarters controlled all operations on Titan. A skimmer strip based most of the cargo skimmers on the moon and emergency supplies and equipment were stockpiled under D-Prime's Mesa. When an EEC force fought its way into striking range of the base, the HEA garrison counterattacked ferociously. So here's setup. HEAs are the green EECs are orange. In the rules it doesn't actually say what is green and orange, but based on the component mix, it's clear that the HEA is green because they have Howard search and the other ones don't. So the components for the HEA, and again, it serial allows you to put them anywhere on the board. And you can see the kind of the base components in you know, the headquarters, power station, etc. And these are basically tunnels that go under the mesa, which is interesting. So as far as what the HEA has, they have three TECVs, two Hoover platforms, one howitzer, two lasers, and I put these kind of these artillery kind of units up in the mesa, thinking that maybe the height advantage of the the height of the mesa might give it some advantage, but we'll see. Two heavy infantry units. And let's see what else. That's all for them. Then the 
And then also, it says you can use all six skimmers, so I used, I have two skimmers for them and the skimmer strip. So for the EEC then, they have more colors coming in, which is interesting. Um, so they have 60 CVs, two hoppers, three drones, two lasers, two head, two over platforms, and two engineers. Set set up. We we'll get to play here. So in play here, I'm a, a few turns in, and I'll show you where I'm at here. So I basically had, so the HEA were set up <clears throat> in kind of their initial position. Um, and the EEC were coming in the side. So what I, my approach was to basically come in as fast as I could with the EEC and kind of overload the edges of the HEA when I think that's been successful. So the, the EEC has kind of overloaded down here. So I got TCVs coming in here. I have hoppers coming down kind of in this flank. Um, so I got hoovers and engineers and drones and lasers coming up on the top here. And there was some combat and lasers you know were lost and you know some attacking units were lost as well and some tcvs were you know, lost down here but it overloaded so it's coming in <clears throat> and then the so the hea has been kind of retreating their position to kind of consolidate here and so tcs are here howitzers are here and so what you see here is that <clears throat> so one option is to you can attack the dam of the Great Ammonia Sea, and when you do that, then it'll it'll flood the dry lake bed. And I wasn't sure what these <clears throat> green plane markers are for, but I found I don't know if they're intended or not, but it's useful to mark the distance that the Great Ammonia Sea has gone. So it's shown here. That's so basically it's flooded. Each turn the dam is broken, it floods basically six hexes. So this is the extent that it's flooded. So to do that, <clears throat> I used a com I used basically hoovers to do that. And normally in combat, on land combat, each time you have a successful attack, you disrupt the unit and you rotate it 180 degrees. And then if it's disrupted again, it's eliminated from the board. And it turns out for the dam, it takes three disruptive disruptions to cause it to happen. So there are three disruptions disruptions are from the <clears throat> Hoover and also a TCV attack and actually the TCV was destroyed after the dam burst because it's destroyed when the ammonia sea floods but the Hoover was okay so that's what's going on here so it's not looking good for the HEA and they're kind of defensively you know flooding to basically the to block some paths, although hoovers can come across. Um, they're trying to block stuff coming in by flooding the sea. <clears throat> so, so that's the, <clears throat> the setup. <clears throat> <clears throat> so then I'll walk you through how a typical sequence works. So the items in the sequence are the electronic warfare phase. The sky combat phase where basically fighters fight fighters. The skydive phase where the fighters can progress on the map and then land to be, get base, or not land, but they basically show themselves on the board so that they're, they're closer to their, their target, but then they're also susceptible to get hit by anti-aircraft fire. And then there's the anti-sky phase or land units to have the capability can attack the, you know, exposed 
you know, fighters that have come, you know, within range of the board. And then there's ranged where sky units can fire to land units and you know, some and then and then land units with range capability fire to other items in, in their range. They've already done their fighting anti sky now they're fighting against land units. And then there's land, land movement where you move the units on the land and you do close combat where the items in within one hex of each other can attack. And then this is the you know attack tables. So the first step is electronic warfare and I found it says you should use a sketch pad for that, but I found actually if you creatively use the it gives you six two sets of six um, you know counters that you, you can use to randomize if you don't even use a dice, but actually I use a dice and just as a side note, this is a, I mean, on, online, sometimes you can find these SBA kind of small dice that are used in their games, and I was able to get that. So, um, you know, the, so these, these, these capsule games don't have dice, but it's kind of nice to have a kind of SBA I wanted to go with it there, so I used that for the dice. But, so if you use these, then, so for the electronic warfare, you're basically trying to jam signals, and the EC has three points, and the HEA has five to play with. So what I've shown here, so since I'm doing the HEA, I'm randomizing, and this is it's it works well for solo because really the only thing you have to do for solo play is to randomize this electronic warfare. Everything else you just kind of change your frame of reference. So it I find it works really well for solo play, and it's highly recommended for that. So it's either two player or one. So, so first I did the HEA. So I said that, okay, um, let's try to jam frequency one with two electronic warfare points, and then frequency four with three, so I have a total of five. And then so I random, you know, I basically rolled a dice and found that for the EC, they're working on, they're taking, they're trying to jam frequency two. And they have three points. They're going to play all those to two. So since none of these frequency coincide with each other, the net effect is there's not jamming. But that's how that works. And then, so, Sky Combat, I mean, all the, at this point, all the Sky units have been eliminated. But they're basically skimmers. So this is what, you know, this, the skimmers would look like. And so they came in quickly, they combat each other, and they so if you get if they get one hit, they're destroyed. Um so they can have a big effect but they're destroyed, you know, if they're hit once instead of two for land units. So the so the EC ones came and they had four the HEA, you know, started at their base and had they only had two, but they were able to so basically, the EC destroyed the HEA, the Skimmer and they are kind of outnumbered. But then the the lasers of the HEA were able to destroy the remaining uh, skimmers or fighters, <clears throat> and the and then also the combat is simultaneous. So the the EC skimmers were also attacking lasers and destroyed lasers. So that's so some lasers got off the board, and then all the skimmers have been off the board. So, so that's kind of what happened with that. <clears throat> so the so you have the electronic warfare, the sky can't combat, which there's no more sky units for that. But um, but how the sky combat did work is you you look at your basically your sky you, your sky combat strength of your attacking opposing units and then based on that you get a combat differential and then from the combat differential and including electronic warfare then you determine um, you know if if there's 
you know, damage, and, and damage is all done by doing a six-sided dice, and then the locking chart tells you how many how many rolls you get. So the better the difference of the many rolls you get. But basically, when you roll under your attack strength, that's that means you're successful and you've disrupted or destroyed a unit. So that's how that works. And so then after. So there's electronic warfare, sky combat, which I talked about, skydive, which basically says a you know a fighter is moving closer to its target, so it has to show on the board is my interpretation. But then when it does it, when it gets closer to its target, it is also susceptible to anti-sky. So anti-sky. So items that have land units that have a basically an alphabetic character here have anti-escape capability and whatever that letter is defines how successful it can be and then you go to this table where you have your anti-sky rating like for instance of a laser it's A and then the the fighter the skimmer has a maneuver rating which is C so you compare you know the A to the C and again including electronic warfare adjustment effects um, from from here, and then you basically roll the dice. You in this case you roll two sided, two six sided, and from that result, then you see if the you know basically you've destroyed the fighter. So that's how that's how anti sky works. And then ranged is a little more straightforward. You basically whether they're you know fighter units, they have a, a range. Rating or land units have a you know range like for instance lasers they have 20 Hoover's only a one so that's how far they can fire and then so the way you resolve combat is it you see if it's in range and then you know again you apply your electronic warfare adjustment factors here and and then you, you also look at terrain effects. So um, these are you, know, you see the combat you know, modifiers here. You apply that, and then you roll a dice. And if if the dice, if your attack strength, your range attack strength, if the dice roll is less than your attack, less than or equal to your your range attack strength plus modifiers and your range combat strength as it's shown here, then you've disrupted the unit. And if a unit's disrupted then, the defensive unit, the rotate it, like I said, 180 degrees, if it's disrupted again, it's removed from the board. So that's, it's kind of nice that you can, that way you can track, you know, you can get, some units you get one, one damage, it's gone, you know, the skimmer units, fighter units. Um, and land units are too, so that's how you can attract, attack, I mean, show that. So, um, and then land movement. So the how far you can move on land then is you know you have a movement allowance. So in this for Hoover at six, and then see so you, that's your movement points, and then how how many movement points it costs to move in the different areas is dictated on this terrain effects chart. So it's for clear for um, and then a TCV for instance is just takes one point so you could if you have a, a 4k ability you can move four. Ammonia is four so that's how many points it takes. Some are prohibited for instance you know, infantry can move into ammonia, so. so that's how movement works. And then you do close combat. So it's the same same approach as ranged combat, except you know, you, you, you have your uh, your close combat strength here instead of your range combat. So so you basically do your modifies fires electronic warfare and train effects. To this, you roll a dice, say if your modifiers are zero, you'd roll a dice, and if it's four or less, you're successful. So in this case, you know, it would be. So that's how that works.
And then, so th those are all the steps. And each, in each combat, so someone, you know, you roll for initiative and then you basically alternate between EEC and um, HEA, you know, individually. So, so you go, you basically, you know, alternate between individual units and combat simultaneous. So you, you, you know, capture it as uh, you don't take damage until you've fired your unit, basically. So, so that's how that uh, works. And um, so overall, for a for a smaller game, I'm very impressed and would highly recommend it. I, you know, given the nature of it, it's got you know it doesn't have a lot of counters. It's got less than a hundred you know marked counters, and then others of the hundred are for you know can be used for marking the the C. But it's got there's some there's some differences between the different sides, which is kind of nice. They're not like completely identical. There are some similarities. Um, the combat is straightforward, but it allows you to capture modifiers. And I mean, I don't like when you have to use sketch paper, but I think if you do this kind of approach with the available, you know kind of randomizer jits. So you can, I think you can avoid doing sketch paper, which is great. So it's everything is here then. Um, so that's, that's good. It's, uh, it's true, you know, I mean, a lot of games are like space opera or, you know, science fantasy. This seems, it's pretty much true science fiction because it, it's got a premise of a, you know, world and what the world is like. And there's a reason why the components are the way they are. Um, so there's some thought into that. So it's a, you know, kind of a true sci-fi. And it's got a few scenarios, and there's variations in their scenarios. There's some randomization. So there's a lot of replayability there. Um, I mean, it's hard to find a downside with it. I, I like also that you can do tunnels. <clears throat> there's some, you know, some interesting, you know, you, you can think in terms of, you know, how the bases are set up. There's, you know, you got the ammonia C that you can deal with, different train effects. I mean, obviously for all the, all these small games, the downside is the limitation of the number of components, but that's just the nature of a smaller game. But there's enough here to have a lot of replayability, I think, and a lot of variation in kind of tactics. And actually, personally, I do, I really like the graphics. I know probably some people think it's a little too colorful, but I, I really like it. It's, it really kind of gets you in the sense of a theme, in my opinion. Um, and, you know, Titan does exist, and it's, what we've learned about is a little bit different than what we've shown here, but you, know, you kind of get a sense of, um, you know, like I said, science fiction. So, um, yeah, it's a, a big fan. I'll definitely do it again. I'd say it's one of my favorite smaller games. So I'll give it a give it a seven. Thanks.